If you want a Winnebago Revel, then chances are you know that the power system is adequate, but it definitely leaves some room for improvement. About that much to be exact. Luckily, Romerig has engineered a fully self-contained lithium power system that fits in the OEM bench seat of your Revel. Getting your batteries out of the cold and elements is just the first step to solving your low power anxiety and improving your life on the road. With your choice of 420 up to 630 amp hours of storage, the entire system can quick charge from 0 to 100% in under 2 hours. You can beat the heat by running your AC for 4 or more hours, making the van equipped for full-time, off-grid living and adventures. No generators required. The best part is, Romerig has installers all across the United States, making install easily accessible to pretty much everyone. With a new lithium system, there will be no more cold nights or coffeeless mornings, just reliable power, on demand, whenever and wherever you need it. For more information, check out Romerig.com today. What's going on everyone? Back with another episode of Stuff and Things. Today we have a how-to slash tutorial style video for you guys and we're going to teach you how to rebuild an S-Bar heating system in a van like the Winnebago Revel from 2018 all the way up to 2020. I'm here today at Rome Rig in Connecticut with the master Aaron and we're going to jump right hey into this thing. So yeah, we're going to get down to it and I'll show you the, the tools you need. So I always like to get my tools ready before I start. I'm a fan of power tools. You don't have to use power tools for this, but that's what I use. You're gonna need a Phillips screwdriver of some sort, two needle nose vice grips. These are for clamping the coolant lines. Don't use official coolant clamp plier things. Use needle nose vice grips, they're the only thing that works. You're gonna want another pair of larger vice grips. You're gonna need a seven millimeter socket, a 10 millimeter socket. You're gonna need a flathead screwdriver. And then you're gonna need a five millimeter hex bit. And that can be a socket, it can be an angle, just something five millimeter hex bit. And the other thing that I like to have is a spill pad. So this I think is a puppy pee pad, I'm not sure, but this <laughs> just soaks up a little bit of glycol that you're gonna spill. So you put it underneath while you're working. So why should people be rebuilding these? So these heaters have a wear item in them, which is the infamous screen that a lot of people have heard about. And generally, I say it's best practice just to rebuild it once or twice a year, depending on how often you use the van. It's pretty easy to rebuild, and it's about $30, $35 in parts. So rather than, you know, saying I'm going to add all this hardware so I don't run the heater while I'm driving, and I'm going to add a heat exchanger, and I'm going to move it, and I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to spend all this money to try to not rebuild it, just rebuild it. It's not very hard once you do it once, and uh, just good practice to get into and then you don't have to count the hours you don't have to worry about it just run it um, they are very sensitive to fuel viscosity so if it's really cold weather and the fuel doesn't have proper anti-gel in it the little tiny fuel pumps that an s-bar system uses can struggle that can cause issues no starts fail to starts also low voltage they really don't like low voltage so in the winter when people's batteries are cold and you have low voltage that's probably what causes a lot of the failures in winter it's actually what sort of starts the, the the ball rolling towards failure. So those are some other things you can look into, um, but today we're just gonna do a simple rebuild and show you what it looks like on a heater that's working fine to take it apart, clean it out, and just do some prophylactic maintenance. So for starters, the location of the S-Bar furnace is found right here under the driver's side running board. The 2018 and 19s are a little more tricky to get to. This happens to be a 2020 that we're working on today. 2018s and 19s, the heater's actually stuffed up in here and it's quite difficult to get to, so you can relocate it to this position. Um, and unfortunately, this is a van that already has it in the nice position, so we're not gonna be able to show that. So what's the first step here? A couple of bolts, so first step, hoses. Um, first step, you want to disconnect the wiring harness. So there's this connector right here, and there's two plugs, and you you kind of press those in, and then you're gonna to have to jiggle it. And sometimes if there's dirt in there, it'll be a little tight, and you just sort of go in and out, in and out, and eventually it'll pop out. Disconnect the wiring harness first. Next thing you want to do is take this black pipe off. That's the air intake. So I'm gonna be using a Phillips head screwdriver in my impact. You can use a hand screwdriver. You can use a seven millimeter socket. You're gonna loosen this hose clamp and then you're gonna pull the air intake hose down out of the way. The next thing that we're gonna take off is the exhaust pipe, which is this pipe right here. 
obviously let your furnace cool down before doing this because those things get extremely hot. Yeah. So that's a 10 millimeter socket and then hopefully it's positioned so you can get to the, the bolt head. And you take that out until it's loose. And then this van is really clean. If it's a van that's been used a lot and it's really dirty, this, this hose can get seized on. And the way to get the hose off is it's going to be a little brutal, but you're going to grab it and literally just wrench it back and forth. <laughs> and that basically cracks the, like the, the corrosion. There's, there's corrosion in there. And then eventually you'll feel it start to move. And then you can kind of just wiggle it down. And then I like to just take this hose and sort of push it up out of the way. Next thing we got to do is there's a little hex bolt right here it's a five millimeter headed um, allen screw and you can take a hex wrench on it and get it loose take it all the way out take that screw out and put it aside you won't need it till you're reinstalling now the heater is actually just sitting in this bracket and it's loose so now you pop the heater down and now it's going to be hanging by the hoses here's where we're going to use the needle nose vice grips go up a few inches above the top of the nipple sticking out of the heater and turn the vice grips until they do a pretty good clamp on the hose and you want to adjust them don't break the hose this is just to be like that again official pliers for clamping hoses don't work you will take a bath in glycol you need to use these next thing we want to do on some revels they have both a hose clamp and a spring clamp. Some Revels just have a spring clamp, some Revels just have a hose clamp. Depends on what day of the week it was, I guess. <laughs> so, use your bigger pair of vice grips, and those work great on spring clamps. Move the spring clamp up out of the way. Second spring clamp out of the way. Next thing I'm gonna do is, this fuel line's very hard to get off and there's a lot of extra, so I use something, this is this, this cool little cutter blade that I have, and I'm gonna cut it just above the, the, the top of the nipple. So you can sort of feel that it's right about there. So that's the fuel line disconnected. Now I'm going to take a seven millimeter socket and loosen those hose clamps. You could also do it with a Phillips head screwdriver. Just works a little better with the socket. Now they're loose. Now to get the hoses off the heater, take a flathead screwdriver Put it between the hose and the heater and just sort of get the hose loose. The hoses stick to the heater. There we go, there's one. And here is the second one. So, as you see with the proper clamps, we don't get anything dripping. If you take the heater down upright, the heater won't spill. The heater is actually full of glycol. So when you drop it, don't have your face under it. Don't turn it on top of your face, you'll take a bath. You can see that's not a very dirty process. All right, now we're ready to go to the bench and rebuild it. Moving over to the bench, what's up now? All right, so we got the heater on the bench. If your heater's really muddy on the outside, really dirty, uh, take it to a sink, plug the fuel line with your finger, take a brush and just get some of the dirt off. Again, this one's very clean, so we don't have to worry about it. First thing you have to do is take a knife and the sticker right here, Cut the sticker. That's put on after it's assembled and we're going to be splitting the unit there. Next thing you want to do is these two small screws on the end. You're going to take a Torx screwdriver, which is a little star shape, and it's a T20. Again, I'm using power tools. You don't have to use power tools. You can do this by hand very easily. Take out your two T20s. Then you're going to switch to a T25. There's two screws here at the bottom. It's gonna be one short, and then there's one that's very long. Set those aside. Next, you're gonna set the heater up like this. Take out all of the screws on top. And I actually forgot to take the uh, fuel line completely off on this. Remember how we cut the fuel line? So, to get the fuel line off, you're gonna take this little clamp off pair of pliers, slides right off, and then I use a knife. You're gonna cut away from your body with the knife, cut through the fuel line, then take a small screwdriver and just get the fuel line off of the fuel inlet hose, like that. 
way easier than trying to do it and slip it off there. It will never slip off. Now we can take that last screw out. So next thing you want to do is pop these covers off. Just put your thumb on the top there and just use your fingers to press. So this cover, just set it aside. This next cover has to come off here. So if you pull on the nipples, it'll pop off. There's a little O-ring on each one and the O-ring fits in that groove. So if you just yank on the cover, these will actually pop out like that, which is fine, but it's easier just to leave them in the cover and pull off like that. Next thing you gotta take off is this little guy right here, this little bar holds down your two coolant temperature sensors. So the cold glycol comes in this side and that's the blue sensor, the cold side, and it goes out where the red sensor is on this side, the hot side. It basically spirals through the body of the heater and that's how it gets hot. So we gotta take these two sensors out so you take that little plate out, and then when you're popping the sensors out, you gotta kind of wiggle them. Don't just yank up on the wires. You gotta sort of use your fingers and just work them out carefully. Don't, don't destroy them. There we go, those are both out. So now we're ready to split the body of the heater. Split the body of the heater, you slide this back cap. Remember we cut that sticker right there and we took all the screws out, slide it up, and then there's this little grommet that has this wire in it. Pop that grommet up, and then this guy, that guard slides off. Set that aside. Some people like to take this, so this is kind of the brains, this is the, the, the control unit for the whole thing, and some people like to take this electrical connector off the control unit. I try to leave it if I can, because these clips are very difficult to remove. There's a little clip on either side here and they break very easily. So unless I have to take it off for some reason, I just leave it, you don't need to remove it. There's two more Torx screws that hold the heater together. They're right here, then there's another one right there. So to get those apart, just take your T25, it could be a screwdriver, you could do it by hand. And now, mm -hmm, nope, one more. I misspoke. There we go. Now it'll pop right apart. So that's, this heater is barely used. It's very clean. This is the burner chamber. We're going to clean this in a second. This is the O-ring that you'll replace with part of the rebuild. And then this right here is the screen. So the way you take the screen out, if the screen slides out, just sort of carefully twist it and pull on it. If this screen comes out, don't take the glow pin out. If the glow pin's right there, it's a pain to remove. Don't take it out unless you have to. Again, if the screen pops right out, you don't have to take apart any more of this half of the heater. You gotta get this gasket off here. This one lifted off because this heater, again, is in very good condition. There's another gasket. To get this gasket off, I use a single edge razor blade and you just sort of put the blade under it and it'll pop off and if there's anything left, you can very carefully take the blade and scrape that gasket material off the surface. For example, right here, there's a little bit of gasket material, just use the blade to separate it from the surface and take it off. Next thing we have to clean is the burner chamber. This part's fun. In this chamber right here, if you have a heater, especially one that's failed and there's been a lot of you know, white smoke, which is actually just diesel, it fills up this whole area in here is hollow and it's actually filled with a mesh material. So the fuel gets sprayed in here, hot, and then the, the flames basically come shooting out of all those holes. They travel down the center of this tube and then they loop back over the outside and then they come out of the exhaust slot, which is right here. So you have to clean out the inside here. And the best way to clean it out is with fire. So I'll take the chamber, put it on the ground, take a good torch and just heat it up. You basically just heat it up until you see it glowing red. If you don't have a torch that can make it glow red, that's fine. Just heat it up for longer. Maybe even put it on a grill. So this is cooled now, and if it was really dirty, you're gonna to wanna to sort of like bang it on the bench, and then see even this one that was really clean, it's a chunk of carbon that comes out of it. So you wanna make sure it's clean. You can use solvent like a brake clean, or you can even use soap and water. If you use soap and water, rinse it out really well and then heat it up when you're done to dry it out or compressed air to blow it off. Just do something to get all of the, the garbage out of it.
Once it's totally clean, you also want to inspect it. Down in there, sometimes you'll see a crack on this face. This little face right here, where my flashlight is, gets cracked. If that's cracked, throw this out, buy a new one. These heaters are about $700 new right now. So if you have a heater that's totally wrecked and it's been abused and your chamber's cracked, maybe your fan's bad, just replace the whole heater. Don't rebuild it, you're gonna spend more on parts. So for people doing this themselves at home, where can they buy a piece like that and where can you buy the actual kit that we're about to install? So the best place if you have a Revel to buy the kit, and the kit is gonna be a screen, an O-ring, and two gaskets for Revels. The best place to buy the kit is from Rickson Enterprises. Um, the reason I say to buy it there, again for Revels, um, is because there's some updates that they have done to the screen so that the screen's more reliable, so you get the updated screen from them. If you don't have a Revel or you don't have a the same D5 that's in a Revel, this is a first generation, I believe it's a D5WS. So this is a first generation D5 from SPAR. If you don't have a first generation D5, there's tons of places you can get parts from. Uh, but I really like SPAR of Michigan. They're super knowledgeable on the heaters and they stock a ton of components. So it's SBAR of Michigan. Um, if you Google it, you can get to their website. Um, and they, you can give them like the, the model number off your heater and tell them what part you're looking for and they can provide it for you. So anyhow, first step in putting it back together is take this gasket, drop it on. It can only go on one way. You can't put it on backwards. And it's got a little tab there. Then you're gonna take the screen and the, the screen sort of has like a fat end and a thin end, large diameter, small diameter. And then it has a seam. You're gonna put it fat end down and you want the seam opposite where the fuel sprays in. So you don't want the seam pointing up, you want the seam pointing away from the, from the fuel inlet. And you take your O-ring. You wanna get your O-ring completely around that little that little ring there, that little flange. Then you can take the burner chamber and drop the chamber down on top. Make sure your screen is all the way in. Take the burner chamber, drop it down on top. Then take the second gasket, put it down there. Now I like to assemble these this way rather than assembling them in the little coolant chamber piece because then you can be sure that the O-ring and everything stays seated. If you flipped it upside down, that O-ring might fall off. Assemble it like this, and you're gonna take this, and if that needs to be cleaned out, clean it out, and just slide it down, wiggle it around to get the screen, and, uh, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the gasket to line up. So now that's fully down, we gotta put all the screws back in. Again, you don't have to use power tools. Something that makes your life a lot easier. It sure does. So don't tighten these all the way. You wanna put all three screws in that hold the two halves together. Put them in just snug, and then we're gonna go back afterwards and tighten them. So that's done. Next thing we can put together is we can get this little air intake chamber on there. So take the wires, make sure the wires are up through the slot that they go through. And then take this chamber, and you want to, sorry, I'm putting it on upside down there. You're gonna slide it into place then it's fully seated when you have an even gap there. Then this wire right here, you gotta take that wire grommet into that slot. And then this back cap here has to come, there's like a little lip right here. And if you put it below the lip like that, the screw holes won't line up. So you have to pull it and you have to get the little slot that's in there over the lip and then the screw holes line up. Once that's done, you're gonna have two Torx headed screws that have this like square stubby head. And those are for the back here. Now we have one long and one short. If you try to put the long one in the wrong hole, it's not gonna go. When it's in the right hole, it will drop down. Same thing with the short side. So you don't have to you know, get too crazy about marking them or remembering you can't really put them back in the wrong spot. Just go down and tighten it down. Next thing that we have to do is put these sensors back. So the hot one, those here and you just gently press it into the boss where it sits. Gently press it in. You're gonna take your retainer and it clips through the wires like that. Then you have the screw that holds down the retainer. 
Just put it down like that. Next cap we put on is this cap. Now notice this little cutout here. That cutout is for this wire grommet. So this wire grommet, make sure the wires are pressed in there. And then when you're putting the cap down, put your thumb over the grommet that the fuel hose goes down. If you just press it down, it's gonna press that grommet out. So put your thumb over there and press down just to get it started like that. And now make sure that this wire grommet here ends up with the wires in the slot, like that. If it's pushed in, then it's not gonna hold the wires properly and seal it properly. Next thing you wanna do is take this cap, and it can only go on one way. There's a little locating thing right there. Carefully press it down. Don't ram it down or screw it down or you can, you can tear the O-rings. Then you have eight screws that hold these down. The long screws go in the back cap. If you try to put them in the front cap, they're gonna stick up really far. That's not right. So they go in the back cap here. And you have four in this. Then the last two screws are these two here. You put those in, tighten them down, and then your rebuild's complete. Back under the van we go. Let's All get right. this thing back installed. So first thing, these spring clamps aren't really needed, so if they're there, just take them off. It makes life easier, then you don't have to deal with them again. I think why they end up on some vans is Winnebago was adding them, or adding the, the other style hose clamp after the fact. I'm not really sure, but. Next thing you're gonna to wanna to do, make sure you have hose clamps in place so you don't put the hose on without the hose clamps. And you're going to just take the hoses, slide them back onto the nipples on the heater. We'll take the seven millimeter socket and we're gonna tighten these hose clamps. You can remove the clamps off of the lines. And you're gonna hear liquid flowing back through the heater. And then you can take the heater and push the heater back up the bracket yep and then we're gonna take the fuel line now getting these fuel line on is not fun it is very tight what I like to do to keep the heater from moving around while I'm putting the fuel line on is take the little bolt that goes through the center start it by hand and cross it really easily and then you got to get the fuel line started and what can help even though it seems kind of brutal to take the pliers clamp the fuel line so you have something to hold on to and then you're just gonna wiggle it on there a little bit at a time. And just note, these are so tight, I don't put that little spring clamp back on. My theory is that it does absolutely nothing because this thing is basically impossible to, to, to put on. I've never had a problem without running them. If you're running a different fuel line that is looser, you definitely wanna run some sort of clamp on there. The fuel pressure in these is very low, so you don't have to worry about the line blowing off. And I basically, Grab the line and just sort of wiggle it down a little bit at a time. Okay. Okay, out of breath. But it is on all the way. All right, now, now we're gonna tighten this bolt that holds the heater down in the center. You don't have to go crazy. We're gonna take the exhaust and put the exhaust back on. Exhaust goes right here. I get the 10 millimeter socket to tighten that. You take the air intake tube, put the air intake tube on, and then reconnect the wiring. And that's complete. And then when you reconnect the wiring, you wanna make sure, like on this one, I'm actually gonna add some zip ties so that the wiring doesn't accidentally touch the exhaust. If, for some reason, your exhaust is like really touching the air intake hose, just bend the exhaust out of the way because you don't wanna melt the air intake hose. And you can sort of form the intake hose and move it around and that's basically it, and uh, this heater's ready to go. So once you practice with this, probably only take about an hour to remove it, rebuild it, and put it back on. So super simple, easy preventative maintenance. So if you guys have made it this far in the video, hopefully this has been helpful for you guys. But now we are going to go check out my van. My setup is a little bit different, and if you've been following along on the channel for a little while, you will know why it is different. This van is fairly new. It seems like the heater hasn't been used very much. Me, on the other hand, I've been living in my Revel for the past year now, and my heat has been on pretty much nonstop the entire winter. 
The last time I serviced my S-Bar heating system was back in September. It is now currently March. And this is what my screen looked like there compared next to a new screen. So we're gonna pull mine out and show you guys an example of what I would assume to be a pretty dirty system. All right guys, so out here at my van, the sat van, I have relocated my actual furnace for the system right here inside the engine bay. The reason I put it up here is because it gives you a little bit easier access to getting this thing out for servicing, but also I tied in a secondary heat exchanger over here. What this allows me to do is actually heat up the coolant of the engine in very cold environments. If the heater's running all night, keeping my water and air inside the van warm, that is obviously going to be hot. So then with a secondary heat exchanger in there that we've added, I can turn on a little pump over here. It will pump the hot glycol through the system. It's just an added little bonus. Now previously this was very easy to get to, but of course I installed a snorkel on my van, so I actually need to pull this thing off of here to get a little bit easier access to the S-Bar. This part is not super important for most of you to see because my van is set up a little bit differently than most, so we're gonna pull this thing out of here and we're gonna get right into the rebuild. All right, so we got my furnace out. It is over here on the bench now. While we're breaking this down, let's talk a little bit more about those S-Bar myths. A lot of people aren't really familiar with the systems or hydronic heating systems for that matter. I guess one of the most common things that you and I have both seen is people not knowing how you can run them, when you can run them, how long, and et cetera. I leave mine on all the time. I leave mine on all the time. For storing, months on end. <laughs> storing my vans outside in the winter, heater's on. I never shut it off. If the van's outside, there's water in it, it's on. If I'm using it, it's on. I'm driving, it's on. It's on, that's another thing. If you're driving, you can leave it on. A lot of people think that, I don't know what they think. I guess that it can't intake air as you're moving. It definitely can, it works fine, and it's good to leave it on. If you're driving up over a mountain pass and it is sub-freezing temperatures, you want that thing running or your water has a very good chance of freezing, even though you're moving. Moment of truth. Oh, looks pretty dirty compared to the last. Yeah, so if you look, it's real dirty in there. Oh yeah, that's not good. So look, see right there, see how dirty that is? That's what we're gonna burn off on this one. We're gonna get this burner chamber completely clean. This thing is pretty plugged up. Not even, the worst. I don't even see the screen. You pulled the screen out already? Oh, the screen's on this side. Oh, there it is, okay. So we'll pull it out and see what it actually looks like at the business end of it. Not that bad. Yeah, not too terrible. I think it was worse the first time. Yeah, this one's not bad at all, but we'll put a new one in anyway, because it's a part. Oh, yours is cracked. No. I got a new chamber though, so we'll put a new chamber in it. Oh, yes. See that crack right there? Right oh, there yeah. in the bottom. There's a little hairline there. Yep. So we'll clean this one out just to show everybody what it's like to clean them out with flames, and then we're actually going to put a new chamber in it, because this one's wrecked. All right, so this is what a dirty one will look like when you clean it. This is a MAP gas torch. You can use propane or just, like I said, stick it on a grill. We'll see if this one starts to smoke. I'll take the flame and I'll you know, shoot it through here and I'll... So, this is Talon's old broken burner tube that we heated up. I actually just put some water on it to to cool it down. I'm gonna spray some cleaner in here and you see all this black stuff coming out of it. That's what you're trying to get out when you burn them. You can rinse them in water and there's just all sorts of stuff coming out of it. If you have a lot of white smoke failures, these things get totally plugged up with sort of just gunk. Basically half burned diesel and then once it's full of that, it will never work right. It's sort of like a flooded engine. So real important to keep this clean. See right down there at the bottom facing this direction there's a crack and that's what makes this burner chamber garbage so we're gonna put this maybe we'll stick it in the pile of old Winnebago parts <laughs> So there you guys have the rebuild of an S-Bar D5 heating system. If you have any questions, let us know in the comments down below. Hopefully this helps some of you out there and huge thanks to Aaron for showing us how this is done and sharing all your expertise with us, man. Yeah, and definitely give it a try. Take your heaters apart, break them, fix them, put them back together. It's the only way to learn. 
As you can see, it's not the most time consuming thing to do. You could probably do it in about an hour, an hour and a half, it's your, if it's your first Once time. Once you have practice and if you use power tools. True, there you go, <laughs> from the professional. <laughs> All right guys, well, if you are new to this channel, consider clicking subscribe. Also, if you're a Revel owner, I have a whole playlist of adventuring around the country in my Winnebago Revel, so you can check that out in the corner right up there. That's all for today, so as always, thanks for watching. Cool. Talk to you in the next one. Have a good one, guys.